the great moments uh, of the web uh, that had uh, stopped for uh, a year uh, because Gary could not make it. Is uh, Gary Vaynerchuk that doesn't need much introduction and doesn't need any preparation from me because uh, he's going to drive everything. I'm just going to take uh, questions from the room and have fun with him. So Gary, are you here? Can you join me? Welcome, Gary. Thank you. It's been uh, what a year? You missed one year only, right? Um, maybe two. Two. We missed you. Hello, Paris. <laughs> Good to see you. Great job, by the way. So, you have not slept for two days. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, was that? There's a deeper answer to that. Yes, I did not sleep for two days. We'll get. We have mics ready, so whenever you want to switch to uh, an interaction with the room, uh, we can do that. Okay. You want to talk about your uh, latest news? You have a book. I do. I, I released a book uh, two weeks ago called Jab, 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 Right Hook. Um, it's my take on what's going on in the world of storytelling, specifically the platforms where more and more are spending our times, which is social networks on mobile devices. So what I tried to write is a how-to book as a follow-up to my why books, Crush It and Thank You Economy. And so I wrote a book that has 80 case studies um, where I break down brands, entrepreneurs, apps that do a good job on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Instagram, Snapchat, Vine, um, and ones that don't do as good of a job. Because I think... I, I think Snapchat? The, yeah, well, Snapchat... Brands on Snapchat? Oh, absolutely. I think s right now, Snapchat is one of the most successful marketing tools for me personally with my brand because I think the biggest thing that people wow. are misunderstanding about Snapchat. Would that you like one of us? No, thank you. Okay. Loic, the thing that everybody's misunderstanding with Snapchat in this room, in, in our space right now, is that everybody worries about width, right? Like everybody cares about top line numbers, impressions, followers. People care about dumb fucking data. Right? They care, they care about the wrong thing. They're caring about... Especially when they're fake. Especially fake, when they're what? Like fake. I yeah, mean, well, it's like... Of course. How many millions of followers do you have? Uh, that are bots or things of that nature yeah. or don't care. It doesn't matter how many you have. It matters how many care. Right? I mean, I went through this in the mid-90s. Right? This is, this is history you repeating because itself. Because I remember you telling me about how important it was to build your following. Of course. So you completely realize how full of shit you were at the time. No, no, no. I met you deep in the 2000s, so let's not bullshit. What, what, what I talked about was building a fan base that actually cared, right? So I went through this in the mid-90s. No, to, to be correct, that's what you exactly said. It's because, not about the numbers. And because, not because I'm so smart, but because this is my second rodeo, right? In 1996, when I was building winelibrary.com, I was trying to build as many email subscribers as possible. I started buying ads on email list. Luxury doc, the, if the founders of Luxury.com are watching right now, fuck you. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> yes, please. In 1996, we lost context here. In 1996, I bought Luxury.com an ad on their email list because they had two million emails. I thought it was going to be incredible. I mean, I didn't sleep the night before. I had Wine Library ready. I was going to pack every order. This was going to change my business. Two million emails, this is crazy. When they send that email at noon, I'm gonna be ready. Here comes all these wine orders, luxury.com. It's gonna be the best kind of customers. And then it's, you know, 30 minutes after the email goes out and I have like one order and I'm like, oh, it probably didn't go out. And I emailed them and they're like, we sent it. And I was like, shit. And literally at that point, I understood that it wasn't width, it was depth, right? And so by 1998, I cared about open rates and click-through ratio and things that actually mattered. And so as Twitter came along and as people in this space started, I started getting out there, I wasn't worried about building my Twitter following top line. I was worried about people actually caring, vaniacs, people that watched, because at the end of the day, that's what matters. What Snapchat is doing, everybody, is very simple. It's not about how many impressions you get, it's how much attention you get. The one thing everybody in this room 
is tied by. No matter what you do in this room, if you're a journalist, B2B, conferences, sell wine, B2C, startup, app developer, I don't care what anybody in this room does or watching at home on live stream, the number one thing we all have to do is tell our story to somebody along the path of them making a decision. Before you tell your story, you have to have somebody's attention. And what Snapchat does is it gives you the attention. I've not been able to make something trend on Twitter for four years. Once famous people actually started coming on, my days were over, right? You're Sna- trending right now. Le web is number one Twitter trend. No, I'm talking me, I don't give a fuck about you, <laughs> me. I was unable to make anything, tre- you know, back in 08, 07, 9, I could make things trend with a tweet, blah, blah, blah. The first time I've been able to make something trend in the last three years was this August when I sent a Snapchat to 4,000 people. How can you send a Snapchat to 4,000 people? Hustle. It took me 49 minutes to select every person by hand. Not this bullshit update product they have that's called stories that suck shit. Yeah, no one I'm, uses that. Shit. Right? They'd like people to use that. The single reason I thought Snapchat should at least consider to sell their company for $3 billion was because how shitty their update was the last time around makes me question if there's any real product people there. I mean, I love the company. I fully believe that they've figured something out. I believe the attention matters. I love it, but that last update was shit. So they lost a billion in valuation. Well, no, I mean, it just scared me, right? I've been so bullish on it. I've been putting my ass on the line about this is a very important platform, and they've let me down a little bit. But I hope I have an in-team figure But Gary, out. so most, yeah. most, most people here in the room, who has used Snapchat in the room? Yeah, you got caught. You got caught. Admit right now that you got caught. You didn't expect that many no. hands to go up. Admit it. Look in the camera and say you were wrong. Where is it? I was wrong. No, that was the wrong one. <laughs> Let's clap that up. He, that you've never seen before. <laughs> First time. That's inaccurate. I, 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 no, but, I, but, I screwed but, up many times on this stage. But let's talk about it for a second. About it. It's about attention. And so I took a picture of myself holding up a bottle of wine with a hashtag. And after those 5,000 people, in two seconds, a ton of them posted that picture on Twitter with that hashtag. And I was able to make a trend. And what it taught me was the lesson I learned in 96 about open rates and conversion. Which is, it doesn't matter how many, I, with my million followers here, or my two million on Google+, Plus, or this and the other thing. The 5,000 on Snapchat are real and more importantly are paying attention, are really focused on it and, and I think in general everybody in this space, when I mean this space, I mean this whole tech thing that we're all a part of, if you're smart enough to be in this room or watching right now, we need to start caring a lot more about the depth of our relationships, our customers, our opportunities and not the width. Because it's the same Looks like you have a few fans Thank over you. there. Yeah. I like, I like this would corner. You, would you like some um, of us to, um, it, it, it's, um, Most brands just care about the audience, right? They buy, they still buy how many visitors? Well, brands have, listen, in, so let me, uh, most of you don't know who I am. I run a social media creative and strategy shop now called Vayner Media. Uh, That's for plug, right? What's that? That's for plug. I'm sorry? You asked me about the plug that we should put on the... Uh... Oh, no, no, I, no, I mean... This, this is wrong, I'm just... You know, <laughs> VaynerMedia is... Tell me about your business. My business right now, so I have the wine business that some of you know, winelibrary.com, that runs itself. Um, and then I spend all my time now on VaynerMedia, which is a social media strategy and creative shop. So we produce content. So you monetize your knowledge, basically. In yeah, I mean, to it, it started with me. We're now 300 people. We've gone you from 300 people. We've gone from 20 to 300 in the last 24 months. So I've been operating, right? I've been head down building another business, um, and now it's much more analytical. And there's other people with brains, and we have a real organization. And so you consult for brands? Is that your model? No, well, that we sounds d- like an agency. No, we, we are an agency. We're you very, are. we're very no, no. unattractive. No VC thinks I'm cool. It's very unattractive. There's no big multiple on the EBITDA, but we make a fuckload of money. It's weird. Um, you mean profit? Yes. 
Um, oh, right, with thanks. no funding. It's, you know, it's a strange new concept. It's called profit. Gary, um, that will not take you to $4 billion in valuation. <laughs> right, listen, I'm not going to sell for $40 billion, but more importantly, I'm, I'm grooming talent. I'm building an actual business. My brother, AJ, is my partner. He got out of college. It was very important to me that he learned how to run a P&L and not raise money. So we built a practical business. Well, thank you. You know what? I fucking love Paris. You guys are clapping at the right shit. <laughs> um, so we built this company. We do strategy and creative. What I mean by that is when we land a new client like we just did with Mountain Dew or, or Dove, Dove Soap or you know these big brands I work with, GE, we walk in and we actually ask them what do you want to accomplish? Like, what is your business objective? And what we then do is decide which platforms that we think are the most lucrative to convert that. But let's face it, the most brands are totally boring online. Right? Absolutely boring. Uh, no, no. And mo mo the most people and brands and companies, like, everybody sucks. Right, like 99% of the shit that's in stream now is garbage. Because marketing because sucks, and all they want is to promote their crap. Absolutely, and, and, but not only marketing, people. Like, you know, most people suck because they just want to promote their stuff, and, and that's so how- how do we fix that? You have, if I'm a sucky brown, I am a, um, ooh, I, I don't want to piss off anyone here. You better be careful, because yes. everybody is a sponsor of Let's this fucking see. conference. <laughs> What brand can I quote without, you know, upsetting I mean, anyone? He, a uh, toothbrush uh, yeah, I mean, he, brand. So listen. Toothbrush. Let's say I'm a toothbrush. No, but that's a good example because no one cares about a toothbrush, right? Well, nobody cares about a smoke detector, but the last fucking guy figured it out, right? So I think, I think, <laughs> I think what it comes down to is this. We should do connected <laughs> toothbrushes. Of course. Listen. Yes. Like, listen. My toothbrush you would be count? text. My toothbrush would be texting me right now, like, get to the dentist, asshole. You know, I mean, it's gonna happen. Um, the reason I came up with the title of my last book, Jab, 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 Right Hook, is to fix this problem. I want to start this dialogue, which is give, 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 and then ask. The reason I've been able to build businesses is I don't think I'm entitled to anything. I actually think that's the biggest problem we have right now. This level of entitlement, just because you launch an app doesn't mean you're going to get users or you're entitled to it. So my big belief is that you have to give, you have to give, you have to give, and then you have the permission to conceivably ask for the conversion, the right hook. And you were in the plane, but Evernote, Phil Libin was there, was explaining just that. He says, I've been giving for four years, Evernote has been free, then we did premium, like five bucks a month. That's right. And now he sells products. He sells scanners and stuff. Guys, in life, a funny, you know, the best way to get something is to give something first. It, you have the leverage. I don't understand how people don't understand this. Now, I understand why it happens, because a funny thing happens in the game that we all play in. In a world where you raise money, you're against the clock. You're burning, and you're in bad habits. When you raise money, you spend it on dumb shit. Right, because you got a lot of it. And then it starts burning quicker. And what happens is you start making bad decisions because you're making decisions based on time, not the marathon. For me, because I've always been self-funded and always self-sufficient, I've had the luxury of running the marathon instead of the sprint. When you're running the sprint, you're making very quick decisions and you don't have the patience required to give, 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 and then ask. And so what I highly recommend everybody in this room give thought to, and who's watching, is how do you position yourself to actually create patience so that you're able to execute the right things that ultimately allow you to have the leverage to go in and ask for the sale? Because we're, we have a supply and demand issue. We have a major supply and demand issue. We live in a world now, I don't know if you heard about it, but there's this new thing, it's called the internet, right? And what it's done is it's <laughs> created a situation where the cost of entry into the marketplace of almost anything you do has collapsed in cost and speed of getting to market. So what happens is we have dramatically more supply of everything, of information, of apps, of products, of services, and so the consumer has far more choice. So we have to provide more value than the fact that we're in fucking existence. And so that requires giving up front, and that's something that I think most people are uncomfortable doing, and or, 
the fact of the matter is most people are wired and have the DNA of worrying about what's in it for them and not what's in it for their consumers or partners. How do you uh, build a following on Snapchat? I leveraged my other platforms. So it wasn't one by one? Well, I leveraged my other platforms because I have followers everywhere else. I mean, you know, I don't know if this slides up, it's not, but like... It was, a yeah, second ago, I it mean, was. I mean, you know, forever, I always put my Twitter and Facebook handle. I think it's kind of interesting that I put my Snapchat handle. It was... It's I back, it's back. No, I right. want you to see. I didn't think that we were going to... I didn't know what we were going to talk about, but I asked Backroom to put it up there because I want to build it up. I'm tweeting it out. I'm Facebooking it out. I've emailed it out. I want to build it up because that's where my depth is coming right now. But what's the value of doing a Snapchat for you? Because it's temporary, you know you have the attention. Does it tell you how many? Nothing, so? Louis, nothing is more important than the attention of the end user. Nothing. The attention of the end user is the cost of entrance to accomplish anything. And, and so the attention on Snapchat is coming that if you don't watch it now, it's going to be gone forever. That's right. Do you think that's an interesting model? Like, like uh, Guy Kawasaki, you might get a little old, I think. Sometimes, I don't know, I'm just kidding. But he was saying, I'm posting four times on, on Twitter now. He was repeating the messages. You know what he does, right? I, th I think that's an interesting strategy. I, in 2013... But that's the opposite. In 2013, I've posted the same message on Twitter more than once for the first time in seven years because I agree with Guy. The stream is so busy that if you have something you want to say, you have to be strategic. And I think... And listen... But you give up doing that? No, I didn't do it from 06 to 2000. You do it now? I do it now. I oh, do so you spam the stream as well? I, I don't think it's spam. I think that's your funny way to make a joke. I think what I'm doing is when it's, when it's, when it's 9 o'clock in the morning Eastern time and I want to say something that's important that day, I'm smart enough to realize that it's 6 o'clock in the morning uh, in San Francisco and I have a fan base there and right. I need to wait. And if I am a loyal follower of yours and I read the tweets from Gary Vee, I see four times the same crap. You, you, yes. The, on the that's horrible. I understand. On the flip side, the reality is the stream has become so busy that I've looked at my data and my feedback that people are missing it enough, and not to mention, it's so fast. Everything is microseconds that you're not so fucking devastated that you're seeing something a second time. It's not the end of the world that I saw a fucking tweet a second time. <laughs> not to mention, Given the fact that I try very hard to provide value and respond to everybody at scale and put out good content, I'm putting out value. It's not about how many times you say, listen, somebody might be following you, Luik, and you don't put out any good fucking content, so it's a complete waste of time. It could be. Could be. Right, I mean, but li li Do listen, it's a open to the room? We're, we're, we're having a little bit of fun, but the truth is the truth, right? The, the fact of the matter is that if you're putting out quality content, you're probably less upset that you saw the same quality content twice versus 10 pieces of content over a month from somebody who's bringing you no value. At the end of the day, this is all about value. It's about value, right? It's, you're either entertaining people, right? You're either creating a utility. I mean, why did Instagram really work? It wasn't a social network. It made us better at taking photos, which we care about, and that utility made it extremely popular, and then all the other layers came in. So you can either be a utility, you could be escapism, because all of our lives are busy and intense, and we need a little bit of escapism, or you could be entertainment. And if you don't understand that, just look at the front of your phone. I promise you, the things that are on the front of your phone sit in one of those three categories. And the front of your phone, what is on your home screen on your phone, is the single clearest gateway into the psychology of what human beings care about in today's society. Wow. Oh yeah, I could be smart too. I, don't, I, I, I can be entertaining and cursed, but I've got some thoughts. Would you like to keep talking alone or should we... Um, no, I enjoy our conversation so much. Me too. I am actually trying to piss you off and I fell so far. You're like so mellow and nice uh, and... I'm a new Gary V, Loic. Yeah. You're like... I mean, you would have been I'm upset old. at me I'm already old. I mean, three the times. Hair's, I'm old. I, uh, your hair older. is gone? Well, you... Yeah, Talk to me about it. But when you have such a beautiful face like <laughs> you do, you can get away with anything. Thank you, Gary. That's why I... I, I it's your it. eyes. It's your yes, eyes, it's right? The eyes, yeah. Gorgeous fucking yeah. eyes, Louis. Thank you, Gary. So we'd like to take some questions. Okay. All right. Who has a question? Here. Because that, that's, that's why they came for. Like, not for me asking stupid well, questions. Well, let me... Excuse me one second, my friend. 
th- that's a whole nother conversation. One of the, if I thought that I could come to conferences and just do Q and A, I would. If I was known enough or if I didn't think people thought it was lazy because I actually think Back to what I just said earlier, which is value is what matters. I think at a conference, the content, you can go home and watch anytime you want in your underpants, right? You know, that is amazing what you just said because we put everything on YouTube live and we post it all on YouTube, everything for free. The content is there, right? And unfortunately, 90% of the people that speak give the same fucking presentation for three years, right? So you don't need to see it more than once. What I think is really interesting in conferences is the engagement, which is why so many people are out in the hall right now engaging with each other. We put the Twitter wall up, so just to, so uh, that great. we see that they hate us, we, we can know. I see it. And number two, I think, I think the biggest thing that we're gonna see after this content play play itself out a little bit, I think the next thing and the one thing that a lot of people should be thinking about is access. I think access is an incredibly high value proposition and that's why I want to do Q&A right now. We actually get to engage during this limited time, it's the access. Yet you don't take the questions. Yeah, so it's a very valid point. Boom. Keep talking, it's good. Yeah, yeah, okay. hi. Um, I don't think we need a connected toothbrush. You're eating too much chocolate, like yeah. we saw that. No, I know. Uh, anyone um, want some? Why? What's your, awesome. what's your name? <laughs> yes, Carlo De Marquis like from Italy. It's, it's so good. Wide know. and deep, you said. So I was thinking, forget <laughs> WeChat, Line, Cacao uh-huh. Talk, which by accident nobody really mentioned in these two days, which I'm amazed. It's absurd. It's it's but American bias. Deeper, yeah, could be deeper than WhatsApp. Can you ma- I can't imagine something deeper than that, but you see a way for brand to enter that space at the moment. What's different about that is it's one-to-one communication. I mean, one of the biggest debates about Snapchat is can you monetize one-to-one communication? Monetizing texting, which is what WhatsApp is, is a very difficult proposition, right? I mean, what, what I think Snapchat ultimately will do is go one-to-many the way I'm using it right now by fucking hand. I'd like to have the select all button. They don't want to do that because it takes away the intimacy. Um, This is me assuming what they're thinking about. They went half pregnant with stories, but as a shit experience and a shit UI. For them to truly monetize, they're gonna have to go one to many. Monetization works at one to many. Monetizing one to one doesn't, which is why a lot of people struggle with WhatsApp and things of that nature. So far, I'm sure there's some brilliant girl right now in you know Scandinavia who's come up with a way to monetize one to one, and I can't wait to see it. I haven't figured it out. Nobody else has. Until somebody shows that, or we get into what I think is gonna happen, which is people are gonna start paying for services, right? I mean, at some level, back to the jokes I was making early on in the conversation, there's going to be a $20 a month or $20 a year app that might be one-to-one that wins at scale because it's so incredibly strong. People will pay, people will pay. And I think that, that is an interesting variable that I think has a chance. I always thought Path or other people could go down that route. Um, but that's why people aren't talking about WhatsApp or even Snapchat. The reason I see Snapchat going that way is much like the way Twitter felt right to me in 07 and I knew what to do with it, Snapchat's worked that way to me. But it's been one to many. It's been able to make something happen for me at scale. But do you think, do you think people in Paris, for example, would pay for Ibra to, to really WhatsApp with them in the future? I, I think you can make people pay for anything. Let me explain. If we went in a time machine and showed people this and said, people in 2013 spend $2 on this shit, they'd say, fuck you, it's free. It comes out of the, so the fact that we as human beings pay for this right here, water, we'll pay for anything. I mean it. What, what, what it, what it took was somebody figuring out how to package it and had a story tell, right? There's some dumb people in this room that think these waters are different, right? That's good fucking storytelling, right? So I think that that's what it's gonna take, but I think that could be done. Heli? Hey, thank hey. you, thank you for the sample on Amazon of your book, it's awesome. Thank you so much. I just had to say that. But anyway, what is the emotion created with this attention 
what is this access? What's the emotional connection there? And is it that we don't have an emotional connection anymore? No, the emotional connection is completely predicated by the creative, right? The emotional connection is the picture you actually take. That's gonna be different for everybody and how they storytell. That's actually where the rubber hits the road, right? This whole game, distribution's mapped. Word of mouth on the internet is mapped. The social graph is mapped. That redhead dude that was here, he mapped it. His company, well he. The company Facebook, they mapped it. That's not what matters. What matters is what story you actually tell. The emotion is predicated by what you actually put out there, right? The emotion you get out of a song or a movie is based on that, not based on how it was distributed to you. What Snapchat is doing is not changing the emotion. What it's doing is it created a utility that actually gave you the opportunity to get somebody's attention in a very noisy world. But your, your book, the emotion you create, to my mind, is hopefulness. The story makes me feel like something good is, can happen. I can make something happen by what you show me. That's my idea. But that's me being, but Gar I'm, an, Gary, I'm should, an optimist, right? You should do a church of Gary Vee. Well, I've been thinking about it. You know, you you know could, that would you be could, a good next step. You, you, you know could, those churches in the U.S. where you have those thousands of people, and and business-wise, it's like what Mark Benioff is doing with no, listen, Dreamforce, I right? Think, you know, you have it, like fifty thousand people coming, and 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 because Mark is so magnetic, right? Yeah, no, I and think you're the same. No, you I should, think you should do that. I went to go see Book of Mormon on uh, Broadway, and you know these Mormon guys—they figured out a real racket. And so, you know, starting a religion, whatever gets me to buy the New York Jets, I'll fucking try it. <laughs> Next question. Uh, what do uh, you think, oh, uh, yeah, what do you think uh, the biggest mistake that young startups and young entrepreneurs are making in trying to get new users in this really, really in, uh, just busy time with social media, like you're saying? You know, I think most, the biggest single mistake that I see young entrepreneurs making is two things. One, not realizing that they're, they're actually not an entrepreneur, right? Let's address this, right? And this is a real, real statement. This is a real tough one for me to say because it's a very I douchey, it. it's a very douchebag thing for me to say, but I think it's an important conversation that we have. I think we're living through a very attractive time to be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, you know, fucking, you know, Mark put on a hoodie and a movie came out and, you know, Instagram made a billion dollars after 500 days and everybody decided they were an entrepreneur. The amount of Ivy League schooled kids that I'm meeting right now who think because they went to Stanford or Yale or Harvard or Brown, what have you, or anywhere else, obviously I'm in the US, that think just because they're smart students that they're entrepreneurs, that then I watch and the first taste of adversity that they get, they crumble like a bunch of fucking bitches and so I think the first mistake we have right now is we have an issue where people have decided they're entrepreneurs when they're not. You know, I think that's the biggest problem. Number two is people think it's a lot easier than it is. I mean, listen, the press, you, for every Instagram, there's five million Insta shit, right? And so, you know, the, like, I, I think we're, we're in a, uh, we're not in a bubble financially because we're You're living... You're not? We're not? I don't think so. Let Facebook, me explain. Facebook, $120 billion, and Twitter, $20 billion. Fine, but How let me... How many times profit is that? Listen, I don't understand anything... And Snapchat, and I'm the first, $4 billion? I'm the first one to... Gary. I made a... Vi let's, let's explain. I made a video the day Facebook bought Instagram. I was on CNN, and I said they stole it. You sat up here just a couple hours ago and saying everybody thought you got killed, now it looks smart, right? So there's smart buys. You were wrong, I was right, okay? So, <laughs> so here's what I think. Here's what I think, Luik. I, I think that there's plenty of things In that are- In 2007, people thought this way as well, and um, when it didn't go- I think well. Andreessen's the one that, uh, this is not it's me. cycles, we're at the top of a cycle. No, we're not. Uber and Airbnb and Nest are just the beginning beginning of technology eating everything in our lives. This is, the be this is not a cycle, this is literally the beginning. We're gonna look back at this as the early, early days. There will be a smart toothbrush, and smart pants, and smart fucking everything, we're just starting. So, number one, I don't think we're in a bubble. I, I do think, though, we're in a bubble of entrepreneurship. I think there's a lot of pretenders, um, and there's a lot of idiots like me that are angel investors who what we do wrong is we seek some 
kids come in with a great idea or a decent idea, and we think about how we would build it as operators, and so we invest not realizing they can't operate. And that's where I've been caught. I, I mean, I think every business idea is good because I think I can make every business work. And that's a mistake, and that's something I've had to fix. Uh, who has the mic here? Over there. Let's follow the microphones. Hi, Gary. And try uh, to go everywhere in the room, please. Uh, so we'll go this way next time. So you, we've heard about your thought on social media, and you also say you hire uh, 280 people in two years. How do you build a culture? How do you make sure that the people you bring in have the same view as you have uh, on social media at VaynerMedia? Very easy. I'm the head of HR, comma, CEO, right? I spend anywhere between two to four hours a day with talking to employees. We don't have a head of HR still because the only way to instill the culture for me is through dictatorship, right? So. I want them to have a sense of values. And listen, we're a very interesting company. I tell everybody, I value how you care about the other boys and girls in this company more than how skilled you are. And people think I'm joking because it's a nice thing to say, but it, then it doesn't get executed. It gets executed in my building. We've fired some of the most talented people because they weren't willing to be the culture fits that I want. Because ultimately, I want to do for VaynerMedia what I did with Wine Library. The reason I was able to leave Wine Library and that $60 million business is because the culture was set and it didn't collapse with me leaving and it's true family. I want to be able to continue to do other businesses so I'm okay with not letting it get too big or as big as it can be up front. Back to what I talked about earlier which is I'm constantly in marathon mode, not in sprint mode so I'm willing to leave 20 to 50 million dollars on the table with this company because I'm spending way t more time than I should as a CEO on HR issues because it's going to pay me dividends in 10 years. It's like the same old story. It's like parenting. This is all like parenting. You know, when your 15 year old comes home high and smashed the car and all fucked up and you grab your spouse and say, honey, we've got to talk about the kid, it's over. You should have talked about the kid when the kid was five, six, seven, eight and you didn't give a fuck and you were going on vacations or work too much. This is about parenting. You've got to put in the work in the first 10 years to get the dividends in the back 10 years. Thank you, Paris. Oh, it's crazy online as well. It's not only Paris. This I know is, uh, you're worldwide, Loic. I put the... Uh, oh, come on. I was talking about you. I'm kidding. I'm having fun with you. Finally, I get you a little upset. Good morning. My Mor name is Giovanna. How are you? Fine. Thank you. <laughs> Where are you from? I am from Bolivia, living in Paris. Uh, my question comes about sharing. Sharing? Yes. Okay. Because uh, you're sharing information, but it's important to know what is the customer, uh, what does he want. So uh, having the customer sharing is very important too. So from my experience, I can see that there are so many cultures where it is very open. So the customer is going to share and share so you can analyze the information. Yes. But you have some other cultures where the customers will not share That's because right. they feel like they are being tracked or, or whatever. Uh, so what I wanted to know is that uh, from your experience, do you think that uh, these customers will in a day converge to a same behavior? Or do you think that we have to deal with it? This, this question is so fun for me because I don't know if you know this, but I was born in the Soviet Union, right? So my heritage is from communism. I was born in Belarus. So when I came to the States when I was three years old, by the time I was 14, I still pretty much grew up in a Soviet household, at least inside, because we were just becoming Americans. So I came from the country that was most predicated on not sharing. I mean, my mother had a refrigerator, which was unheard of in Russia, because everybody was poor, and she hid it in her living room behind a carpet on a wall, because she didn't want her neighbors to know. Like, the ultimate in, in, in hiding information. 
The, the truth is absolutely not. The habits of the US consumer or other parts of the world where they don't fear privacy or those kind of things, they're gonna share. When you go to Venezuela or when you go to certain parts of the Eastern Bloc like Belarus where I come from or other places, they're growing up in a very different environment and their habits are totally different. And it doesn't become a one day thing. I mean you're talking about generations of culture change. When my dad found out six years ago that his phone number to the house was on Google, it was the worst day of his fucking life. I mean, he was devastated because he grew up in a culture where privacy was the most valuable thing and now his son goes to conferences and says privacy is dead, it doesn't mean anything. That's a brain twist what, what, for him. What do you think that the governments so, are real, real, reading our emails for? I think everybody is on the record 24-7, 365. I actually live my life completely with the thought process that everything I do is always being looked at and that's my life. I really do. Now, what does that mean? It means- Your revenue, your profit, your salary. Everything, your... everything. I you wouldn't mind. My porn habits. Oh yeah, they actually monitor that, you saw that. I mean, but they I mean recall that. that so that they can harm you in case they need to. But I really mean that. I truly live my life. I mean, I, I truly Can someone live... build a service that will, uh, you know, hook into your YouTube channel? I mean, um, account. Yep. And each time you watch porn, it tweets it. I'm listen, watching this. Listen, yeah, that's a good listen, idea. I think people are grossly underestimating where the world goes with this lack of privacy. I actually think it's going to be very beneficial. I actually can tell you right now that five years ago I mentally made that decision as I started getting some internet fame and people were taking pictures and things of that nature and I've become a better person because I think that I'm always on the record. It changes your habits. It changes the way you are and I think we're grossly underestimating some of the benefits. I mean as the world's gotten more public, kidnapping is down because it's hard to kidnap because everybody's got a phone. There's a lot of yin and yangs. Everybody looks at the negative. I think there's enormous positives to a more transparent world if we know that we're on the record. I mean, it changes quite a bit of behavior, cheating. You know, there's just a lot of variable changes. I think depending on where you live, you're going to act differently. But I do. Yeah, but if you build a product, like. You're a startup and you build a product, you have to keep it, you know. I just, I'm, I don't think anybody, we live in a very cynical world, we all see what's going on here, and I'm gonna tell you right now that the far majority of this crowd right now more believes that they're on the record 24-7, 365 than they did two years ago, and I think it's just the beginning of that trend. Next I really question. do. There, thank you. Hello, I'm Geneviève Petit from Paris. Oh, Hello. Matt, be careful with Geneviève. <laughs> I'm not scared. So the end of privacy, as you tell us, is also the beginning of uh, uh, totalitarianism in history times. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I haven't, very honestly, I haven't thought about that all the way through, but I think that's right. I mean, listen, we are grossly, grossly, grossly underestimating what's going on right now. This room, this room and everybody watching, we're like the people that know what's going on, right? And every one of us, including me, who prides himself in understanding consumer mental behavior of what happens, all of us, including myself, are grossly, grossly underestimating what's happening. I mean, when everybody freaked out when Amazon showed the drones, I watched all the feedback, I'm like, what do you guys think? I mean, listen, we're all gonna become fucking robots, right? Google Glass, that's preview shit. We're gonna fucking, I'm gonna put shit all on, I mean, we're gonna be fucking robots. And I mean that, I think, I think you know, listen, if we dropped a fucking caveman in the middle of this room right now, he'd be like, fuck, we evolved, right? <laughs> we are, I think we're going, I mean, I think we are dramatically underestimating the culture shifts and the human shifts that are really coming. And I think the companies that are the most interesting to me are actually Uber and Airbnb and Nest because they're giving you a preview of like the real world. Being A lot of it in the last 10 years has been very contained to the digital world. I think our real world is starting to really be, you know, dramatically shifted and intertwined and I think, yeah, I think that's one of it. I think it's what we consume. Bitcoin, I mean, how about Bitcoin? Bitcoin is so confusing to me. I'm just not mathematically smart enough. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's incredibly interesting. Is it interesting. like Napster? It's the first version of something disrupting everything, I mean, but illegal, that I it's going to die, and I, then the next one. I will... thought Facebook credits was going to change the world. For all my predictions that have been right, go watch my keynotes two years ago. I said all of you would use Facebook credits all the time. To me, at some level, that was a preview to Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin's massively interesting. I don't understand it. I really don't. Just because I don't understand currency and I'm not mathematically smart enough to talk on this issue and haven't done the homework. But yeah, I think it's that kind of stuff. I mean, I just, I, I'm completely convinced that all of us in this room will be flabbergasted what the world looks like in 15 years. Flabbergasted. Next question. Here, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Darko. I come from Macedonia. You said brands have stories. We all have to have good stories. At Viner Media, do you help brands develop their story or do you create stories for them? That's a great question. Thanks. What we do really well, so the answer is both sometimes, but the truth is, this is where I think people get confused. You know what we're really good at, what my new book's about, and what we do at Viner Media? We tell stories contextually to the platform they're in. Meaning, it's, I almost called the book slang marketing. Meaning, if you want to promote on Tumblr, you better know how to make animated GIFs. If you want to play on Pinterest, you need to know what an infographic is. You also have to respect the psychology of the end consumer. So a lot of people in this room, no matter what you do, you're using social networks as distribution to somewhere else. Most people here, and I was watching all the web hashtag work, most people here use social networks as modern day email services. They blast out awareness to something else. They use and they put a link and they drive you elsewhere. I believe that is the biggest misnomer around social right now, that people are underestimating storytelling within the platform, right? Wait, can you teach us? Yeah, so if you are not put, Animated GIFs do 700% better on Tumblr than a picture for certain brands. So you should do more of that. That is the slang of Tumblr, right? The proper use of hashtag. The amount of people here that want to create their own hashtag and start a hashtag or get their brand or businesses or apps hashtag trending when they have no fucking chance versus looking at the 10 hashtags that are actually trending and looking at them and trying to be creative to take one of them and still tell you what they want to say by using one of the hashtags in there, that's a tactic that we see over 2,000% higher engagement and awareness by using a hashtag that's already trending and being creative how to put it into your copy instead of you thinking how to do that, right? Psychology, a 28-year-old female that's on Pinterest, that's on Facebook at the same exact time, has a very different psychology. When she's on Pinterest, she has intent to buy or aspiration to buy. When she's on Facebook, she's getting informed about her world. The way you have to story tell to her in her stream is very different. But everybody here just puts the same fucking picture on all the platforms, or even worse, the worst fucking move, they have their Twitter and Facebook linked, oh, so when they put one, the it goes somewhere else. Stop fucking I, doing that. I, yeah. It makes no sense, it doesn't work, and it just proves that we are trying to use these platforms as distribution instead of actual places to tell stories. Posting Twitter stuff into Facebook is So what we do well is we take what story they want to do and we make it contextual to the platform we're putting out the content on. Uh, where's the next microphone? Yeah, here. How about so, some people up there? I like those people. They're real chill it's, and laid back. It's just that we, we want to reward those who stay with us on stage. It's like they're on stage, but sure, we I can know, go. But like, okay, we'll what, go you what, you don't like those people? I love those people. Okay. I love them, Gary. Thank okay. you so much. So, it's my turn. Uh, so this is how you talk after two days of not sleeping, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, could you imagine if I fucking it, slept? It, it <laughs> took him a little time to wake up, bro. <laughs> okay, right? okay. The first 20 minutes, he was so <laughs> quiet, and now finally we get a fuck or fucking every 10 seconds. <laughs> Okay, uh, first two questions. First one is you were just mentioning the, let's call it the state of mind of a, of the psychology. a platform, the psychology yes. of the platform. So when you're in Facebook, you yes. have a specific intention. Yes. Maybe this is the reason why commerce is not working over there, or maybe 
there is a great way to make commerce work there, but it has to be aligned with this state of mind. So could you say you, something about you, it? You know the answer. You're, the way you stated my question, the question just now makes, you, makes me realize that you're thinking about this properly. Everybody wants social to act like search. You know, when we search, we have intent to buy often, which is why it works so well. Everybody wanted to apply Google AdWord logic against Facebook ads, and it didn't work. So you're absolutely right. Not to mention, the other reason social's different than other things in commerce is social is truly human. All the cliche things that me and J.O. over there and everybody else has been saying for a long time, they're true. It is human. You have to be authentic. Could you imagine hanging out with somebody who tried to sell you something out of every time they ever talk to you? You're not going to convert. So, so everybody's in the right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook business. And when you know a right hook is coming, you duck. So on social, the pattern is jab, 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 right hook. Give value, give value, give value, and then ask. Nest can't put buy nest, buy nest, buy nest. They have to give you infographics of stuff they have. They have to make an interview with the CEO. They have to do testimonials. Maybe even something that has nothing to do with their business like happy holidays. It's all jabbing that's setting up the opportunity to go in for the conversion. So what you say is that sell, commerce can be great on Facebook, but it has to be uh, um, via a different way of communicating it? This is what you're saying? 100, I'm selling not only for my, I mean, the amount of books I'm selling on Facebook now is incredible to me, even from two years ago, because I've learned this pattern, it's why I wrote about it. Clients that we've had, like Green Mountain Coffee or the NFL, where the KPI was how many people did we convert, right? How many K-cups for Green Mountain Coffee and their curing machine did we sell? How many people did we get the NFL to sign up for their fantasy product on NFL.com? Not on ESPN. And all the clients that I get that are completely conversion-based only on social always hate me for the first six months and always love me for the back six months because all we do up front is jab because we're trying to open up the window for the opportunity to sell. So, okay, you intrigued me for the, uh, seven different questions. So can, can we meet somewhere following this session and ask you a question? Yeah, I'm yes. organizing this right now, actually. Okay. When are you available, you, Gary? You yeah. want to meet uh, some people? Thank you very much. Should I uh, organize your schedule? I'm available now. What's the problem? Well, people need to eat. Yeah, I'll just walk right over there. No, I'll just walk, I'll just hug it out. <laughs> you have a quick, we'll have to stop. Uh, what, no, I, I, he got like upset at me. No, we need to go up, up there now because uh, Gary was... Um, but listen, little... I mean, they paid too, right? I, no, I, I know that. So who has a question? Uh, as far as we can, who has a question? Just raise your hand. See, they're quiet. They have no questions. Those who have questions are here. Okay, See, yeah, one question there. Very good. Hey, how's it going? Good, man. Um, just say, uh, what, what's the future of Snapchat in your vision? You know, how, how's it going to go on? I'm really crazy to turn down four billion. You know, I, I, I don't know. What Snapchat has to prove to me, my favorite conversation since I've been in this space is when everybody who didn't know shit about this said that Facebook was the next MySpace, right? Remember that? Like, oh, Facebook's the next MySpace. You shouldn't invest in this because in four, five, six years, three or four years, there'll be something else. And the reason they were wrong was the question that we had earlier, which was Facebook was being operated by different operators than the people that were operating MySpace. Why has LeWeb been a success for a decade? Because two people have operated this to success. There's plenty of conferences, plenty that haven't gotten as big. There's plenty of everything. Operations and execution matters, right? So Facebook very early on between not only Zucks, but the people that I saw there, whether it was Kevin Collarin or Dave Morin or Cox or Charlie Cheever, like all those great people, you just knew that they had the quality to execute and every time they did a product update, news feed, things that were unpopular, I believe they were doing the right thing and I think that's why they are where they are today. So far, at the height of it mattering, Snapchat has made one product update, one that I think is extremely poor. So for the first time ever in two years, I'm actually slightly down on them because I'm scared that they don't have the product chops to actually take it to the next level. I can't answer your question of where it's going because I tend to not bet on the horse, I tend to bet on the jockey. 
and I don't have a real understanding yet on this jockey to really make a bet because I care about my legacy and I don't want to be wrong with my prediction right now, so I don't know. But over the next year, what they do with the product will really dictate it. This is all execution. It matters so much. Okay, one more and we'll have to stop. Uh, but Gary is here, so we'll have to, you will have to follow you. you, you yeah, what? I'm useless here. <laughs> <laughs> totally useless. Hi, Gary. Uh, my name is Ivan Hernandez, and first of all, congratulations on all your success. Thank you. Um, speaking about growth, um, I think the big mistake that many companies make is growing too fast and just growing for the sake of growing. The, the growth that Viner Media has accomplished is impressive. You know, from 20 to 300 employees in 20 months is crazy. How have you managed to control the growth in a way that actually it's Growing not to get bigger, but growing to get better. Well, Vayner is a very different company, right? You know, remember, I, I have no funding. Vayner's gone from 20 to 300 with zero funding. We've used our own cash flow. So we're building, an, but listen, and I don't think I'm so cool. Like, plenty of people will grow to grow and have a huge exit and be very strategic about it and raise money and do well. For me, it's been very easy. We're growing slower than I'd like because I truly believe our agency with who we compete with can do better work than anybody in the marketplace. But I can only grow so fast because I do have a p and I do have B2B clients that pay me 120 day terms. So I can only grow so quickly, right? Um, you know, I'm very, 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 very proud of how quickly we've grown completely predicated by our own cash flow and our own execution. I think it's a good story for people to pay attention to if they actually care about actually building a, a business versus just building headcount. You know, I want more headcount. I just can't afford it yet. That's it. I mean, you know. Gary, you are uh, happy you came? Because I know you've not slept and uh, taken all I'm that time. I'm happy for you, Loic, that I came. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love Loic. I, I, of course, I'm happy. I, I, this is the the one of the, the premier events in the world. Enough with this premier event in Europe. This is one of the premier events in the world. Um, you know, I'm very proud to have been coming here for a long time. I've missed it for the last year or two that I haven't been here. I see a lot of familiar faces. I hope I see some new faces as I walk out here. And I'm, I'm just very thankful for your attention and allowing me to talk. So should we organize you to, um, like, so we go somewhere and you keep meeting people that you want I to I promised, I actually have a, a like, a, some interviews that I'm supposed to do, so I don't want to be like disrespectful. Right now? Probably. Oh, okay, but, so but give me a time that works for you for, for, for them to yeah, I mean, meet you. What time is it? It's one right now. Okay, so I have to go do an interview that I promised in the press room, but I'm more than happy to meet in the main hall at 1.40. That, that, how about, okay, 1.40? Yeah. Okay, there is a better building for that, if I may. Uh, how about doing it in the Hosman building and the team will show you, because there is most, more sitting space. It feels complicated. It's very easy. Hussman Building 145, I swear it's easy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.